So I'm going to introduce the, the four producers tonight. We're going to focus on a producer panel of primarily um, finishing cattle. We've got one producer that has buildings of ours that he does a little bit of both. Um, the first one we got is, uh, and this, this is actually um, going to be one of our tour stops tomorrow, um, Paul and Justin Shanka. They have a 625 head deep pit barn uh, by the Dodge Howells area that will be turned tomorrow. And we try to put a little bit different flavor so we have some bed pack people on here as well as deep pit finishing. We have Jesse Huff, um, who's going to be the final stop tomorrow. And he has a around a 600 head deep pit that we built, I want to say five, six years ago. And we've recently built a partial confinement cow calf facility um, that we'll be able to uh, show you tomorrow as well. He's going to be one on here. And then we're going to go to a bed pack. And this is one of probably our older facilities. Um, I know Victor says that he is backgrounding in it now, but Victor has, Victor Bolsowski has a backgrounding operation and, and small, but it works darn well for him. And then the final one, uh, one of the, one of the preferred, preferred building types that we have is the AccuSteel fabric building. And Jason Owen is the manufacturer of that, but he kind of wears two hats. And so we're going to have him come up here because along with his manufacturing side for the building, he's also a cattle feeder too. So I guess that's why we let him wear a cowboy hat tonight. So we'll have all four of them come up and we can get started with this, with the producer panel. Uh, no, we're not going to let you go back. You don't get uh, you don't get to leave that easy. <laughs> not a short chair, just a slow chair. All right, very good. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us again here this evening for our our final segment uh, here as a producer roundtable. Uh, just so uh, uh, you don't wonder who this guy is, my name is Chad Moyer. I work at KTIC Radio up in West Point, Nebraska, uh, part of the Nebraska Rural Radio Association, the only farmer-owned, farmer-led group of radio stations in the country. We own 14 stations across the state of Nebraska, including uh, several in uh, West Point and York and uh, Lexington, and then a cluster in Scotts Bluff as well. But uh, I'm happy to be your MC here tonight. I'm going to hand this off to you. You hold that for the moment. Okay, so uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Uh, we want, I want, we all want this to be very interactive here tonight. Uh, my job is to kind of facilitate the discussion here tonight. I'll be asking questions and, and things like that of our producer panel. But I, we, we want some um, we want some questions from you. On your table, you see the note cards, right? There are note cards on there. Please feel free to write down questions, thoughts, ideas, comments. Uh, if you want to get reaction from one or all of our panelists, uh, make sure you write on there. But uh, do please write down your thoughts and your questions and your ideas. And some of the CCS people will be around to uh, collect those cards, and then um, I'll be able to, then I'll, I can kind of arrange them and ask them, and uh, we'll kind of get uh, kind of an organized uh, Q and A panel going here tonight. So please, I want this to be uh, very interactive. Uh, we thought it would be better that you write uh, your questions on the cards versus having the microphone. And sometimes that intimidates people. So we'll skip that, write the, card, uh, write the questions on the cards, and we'll get them asked. So first thing we need to do, though, is uh, uh, Tony did a very good job of uh, giving you just a little short background on each one of these growers, on uh, each one of these producers. But we're just going to go right down the line, and I'm going to have you kind of introduce yourself and tell us about your facility. Okay, so three things I want. Introduce yourself, tell me a little bit about your facility, and what was the, um, what was the, the thought process behind building that facility. Okay, so we're just gonna start right here on this end, and we'll work our way down and just get a little bit of introduction uh, from our panel here today. Go ahead. Okay, I'm uh, Justin Shanka, Paul's my dad. Uh, 
We built a 625 head deep pit cattle barn. Uh, we built it because I came back home from college and we fed in a yard up by Euling, Wise and Camp Speed Yard for five, six years. And it did amazing for us up there. So when I came home, we looked at building confinement because DEQ, by the time you figure the lagoon and your pivot and uh, you couldn't build wells and you dig a well, so your pivot's gonna be shot right away almost. So by the time we figured that, we said we we're gonna do a confinement. And we looked at the difference between a bed pack and a deep pit barn, and we don't have a manure spreader, we didn't have a bale processor, nothing. So by the time we figured buying all that equipment, we paid for the deep pit, and we didn't have to do even half the labor with the bedding and all that. And that's kind of more about me, I think. Paul? I'm like you said, Paul Schonk and his dad. <laughs> fed cattle with my dad since 83. I think it's a good prospect for him to come into. Land in our is hard to come by. It's expensive. Don't matter if you're buying it or renting it. We're looking at utilizing our own products. We're utilizing the manure out of the building onto our ground. Kind of looking at the fact of building everything with it. And like he said, we've been down the road. We custom fed in a couple of different yards. We still feed in another yard beside ours. We are always comparing ourselves, but the shed seems like a good alternative. Cost up front looks like a big thing, which it is, it's a big step. But in the long run, from what we've seen, feeding different places, different environments, I really think in the long run, this is the way and the coming issue with all the environmental impacts. I'll pass it on. All right. I'm liking, I'm liking second, second spot, because he covered it. <laughs> well, I'm even better because you're covering almost everything in Iowa to cover. Um, we built our uh, deep pit barn uh, six years ago, and it mainly was can we stay in the same footprint and expand our Might capacity? Be right there you go. Um, it, I'd say it's worked well, um, learning a lot of things about it. And then we've also added um, a covered area for 200 cows to a calf, and we're going to calf twice a year here in March and then in August. And I'm Victor Boslowski. I, I put up a building about seven years ago. Excuse me, I put up two of them. Um, I have a 176 footer and a 112 footer. And um, I, I looked at this for about four years before I did it. I went on a lot of tours, um, especially with uh, the AccuSteel company, because that's the product that we put up. Um, and then we got to a point where we need to make a decision. And so we met with Mo Russell's consulting group. I don't know if those of you in Iowa probably know of him. He uh, is out of Penora, Iowa. And uh, we looked at all the different things. And one of the things that was on the table was buying a million dollar quarter or putting up uh, some cattle finishing. And we chose to do go with the cattle finishing. We did that for three years. And um, I'm a hard guy to get along with, and I couldn't get along with cattle buyers. So I quit doing the cattle finishing. And uh, we went to backgrounding cattle. And so uh, um, this works out good for us. It, it's just like farming another quarter of ground, only everything is there. And um, I work really hard. To f this business is a tough business. And how do, how do we produce the most off of our land? So we background 400 head of calves every year. So do you know how much pasture that would take? And I can't find that in my area. I got, I got it figured out. I can do it with 30 acres of rye and some other products for rough age and third, and then after that's taken off, produce corn silage. And I got my rough age needs. And so that that works really well for us. All right, one more on the end. Mike. Touch the bottom. There's batteries in the podium. Okay. Well, I get started. How about I, how about I do this? I'll give you this and I'll work on this one. Right, sounds good. <laughs> I've got a loud voice, so I probably don't even need one. But my name is Jason Owen. I'm the owner of AccuSteel. Um, thanks for having me out here for our, our dealer CCS. We uh, actually are celebrating our 20th uh, year this year. So we started back in 2001. So it's uh, been quite a journey getting here. But uh, 
Uh, about six years ago, I was able to build a uh, research and development barn, right, where we manufacture buildings where I live, uh, south of Templeton, Iowa. And uh, some of the technology that we tried to include in our barn was a, uh, having some customers up in northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin that were in, uh, doing uh, dairy scraper chains. And we saw that what a lot of customers were trying to, to deal with was trying to mechanize or get the manure out of the barns uh, more efficiently. Uh, we were trying to kind of make a combo system where we could still have the benefit of the bedded barns, but also have the labor savings of the pitted barns. So we worked that system for a couple of years, found that it was very variable on the manure as you brew cattle, we only had one barn at the time, so as we took cattle from 600 pounds up to 1,400 pounds, that manure really changed. Um, I had a background from Iowa State University in engineering, so we were trying to apply some different different technologies into finishing cattle, and we learned we learned a lot. I learned probably as much about manure as I did about feeding cattle those first couple of years, but. We found that the separation system that we're trying to use to separate the water to get a dry product, we, we tried some manure bags. We tried a lot of different innovative ideas that we saw in different parts of the country. And uh, what we ended up doing long term is we now use that building to start cattle in. So we try to buy between 550 and 650 uh, pound cattle. We started in that facility. Um, we had it designed for 800 head of confinement. Um, and then we backed that down to 800 and then about Three years ago, we built a uh, finishing facility. So we're trying to adopt a little bit of the model from um, maybe the swine industry where we have a specific barn for starting cattle and then we've got a specific barn for finishing. If we ever added another barn, if we wanted to go to a deep pit uh, system, we could have the cattle on, on slats for 120 days and really finish them on there. We think that's where those, those slats really, really show for our customers that have them currently. So um, that's a little bit about our operation. All right, very good. Now you have met and uh, have an in-depth understanding of each of the uh, panelists that are here tonight. So again, I urge you, uh, please, you know, write down some questions, send them on up so we can have a very interactive discussion here tonight. While the microphone is on that end, uh, would you hand it uh, back to Victor there for a second? Because you, you touched on something and maybe you can expand on it a little bit more about how you, you, you've you incorporated your bedded pack system into with the rest of the crops, you, utilizing different uh, uh, forage sources, cover crops, things, things like that. Expand on how you've all made that work, Victor. Well, what I was trying to do is, is can I can I produce as much off of that, those acres to take care of 400 head of cattle? And how many acres is it gonna take? And so I roughly work with about 30 acres of rye and some other grass products uh, to provide roughage, <coughs> and then those acres can go back to corn silage. And always in between those steps, so that's when we put the manure back out, out there. And then when you pull off the silage, well then you, put the rye back for the next year. Um, then every once in a while you want to throw uh, a soybean in that rotation and, and move the ground around. And so that's kind of what I did versus trying to find enough pasture to take care of that many cattle. And uh, uh, it, work, it works out good. Uh, it, you, gotta, you gotta think about it and you gotta do a lot of planning. And so then the only extra things I have to buy is, is like my distiller string and, and my rinsing product and some rolled corn to to mix with, with the product when I make my complete rations. Okay, very good. I open it up to the rest of the panelists. Are, have you guys done anything unique with uh, a, a cropping system or rotation or, or anything like that that you'd kind of like to highlight? Well, I'm gonna ask him a question back. How's the health in that bed pack for those young cattle? I, I've had really good luck. Um, I try to buy uh, all the cattle out of one source. Uh, in Nebraska, we have um, a lot of cattle growing out in the sand hills. And ranchers, ranchers will bring in uh, seven or 800 head of cattle at a time. I try to buy the middle cut out of there. And I have a process where I have a vaccination program that I give them all. And uh, before I, they leave the barn there and my brand is put on them. And uh, I, I, I treat uh, when they come in uh, a feed product, or myosin in the feed, and uh, other than that, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've, I hate to even admit this, but I haven't lost a calf in two and a half years. 
And uh, I know I can go out there tomorrow and everyone did. <laughs> and so I shouldn't have even said it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I have had very good luck uh, with, with everything working. Any other cropping system stories that you guys like to talk about? Well, let's talk, since you brought up health, uh, let's, let's um, see, the thing about Victor, you gotta remember, he threw in that thing about, uh, you gotta throw a soybean in there once or twice. It's because he used to be the executive director of the Nebraska Soybean Board. So, you know, you always consider the source, right? No, go yeah. ahead, Vic. Um, we grid sample our, our, our farms every other year. And, you know, we've seen the phosphorus go, go up quite a bit. But if you ever watch these yield contest people and watch what their, 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 their soil tests look like, you know, the, the amount of potassium to raise 100 bushel soybeans, a lot of us don't have that. So, you know, when you start looking at all these other things that you can get out of there, um, that's been a big plus for our farm operation. Let's go down to the end to Jason. I have a question for you, because you, you made the comment that you saw the manure change, right? Uh, how does that, did that have a big impact? How did that change uh, nutrient management uh, easier, more difficult, any, any effect? Well, we were trying to scrape the manure out with an automated chain system. So we had a scraper system that would go down, scrape the manure, do a cross auger, then it would come back, and the cattle adapted to that really well. It's just that the, the manure different, actually, you know, in the summertime, you couldn't keep the manure wet enough to have the, the scraper system work correctly. And then certain times of the year or the size of the cattle, it, it may overwhelm the system for the separator that we put in. So it was it was a really a variable system. And as we scraped that manure, it may have been pumpable at the time it was dropped. And if it would have went into a pit, we could have pumped it. But by the time we scraped it to the end, ran it through an auger, we couldn't pump it. So it was just, there was lots of challenges with that. I would make a comment though, back to the, to the soil side of things. Um, you know, I, I don't farm a lot of acres back in Iowa, it's mostly family ground, and we farm about 500 acres, and the manure has made a dramatic uh, improvement to our soil and to our yields. Um, you know, we incorporate cover crops sometimes. Um, you, you, you gotta cut the cover crop at the right time. Some of the, I, I feel some of the information out there gets you a little bit too late in that boot stage, and you know, our other big rule is, is that we don't want the cover crop to affect the corn crop. That's what, that's what feeds our cattle. So one of the things that drove this obviously is that we're in the building sales and manufacturing. But the other thing was, it was for a way for me to look at trying to market our corn. So we walk 100% of our crop off the farm. And some years that's good, some years that's bad. And sometimes you end up repricing corn and we all have, but typically we've been able to be what we've been able to, to take to town the last five years. Now we'll see what this year looks like, we'll see what the gills forward looks like, but it's a it's a way to market, and I'm not suggesting everybody put all their eggs in one basket, but it was a way for us to market our grain in um, a different way than just, just hauling it to town and, and, and giving it away below the cost of production. So um, it's more work. Obviously it's easier to run a combine than it is a chopper, and there's you don't have people packing, you just take it right to town, but the idea is uh, it gives us another value source to, to, for, our, for our product, for the crops that we can raise, and then we've got an excellent nutrient going back to the fields that have really improved our soil health, really, um, it, it's been a tremendous impact on our farm, to say the least. I would, I would add that it also helps with your neighbor relationships. I mean, we have 1.2 million gallons to put out twice, so that would be 400 acres a year. We've created a relationship with three neighbors, so we're rotating every four years to uh, create so soil health for everyone in the area and not have to transport it too far and keep the cost down. All right, here, uh, bring the mic down here. Uh, we're going to do a couple of rapid fire here questions. Uh, I'll ask a question, uh, answer it, uh, and a couple of quick thoughts around it. First of all, uh, we heard about um, uh, the uh, animal health aspects with Dr. Erickson earlier today. Um, have you seen increased lateness issues in your system? And just a couple of quick thoughts about that, yes or no? Well, we just built ours this year, so I really can't overly say that, but uh, 
We've had more hit problems this year, but we've had them in the outside yards too, the same with uh, the mud this year. So I can't really give a definite answer on that. All right. Like he said, we just started. Um, the thing he didn't say is the first pens that we've closed out were the pens that we had the hip issues in. Two of the first yards that we just sold out of there here a month and a half ago, when the cattle moved in, they were weighing probably 12 or 1,275 pounds, depending on which pen it was. And people that we've talked to, with, we kind of knew that we were facing that, but we wanted to put that size cattle in there so we could keep our marketing spread out. Our proceeding yards, we do find the hip issue here and there. But it seems like sometimes you close an eye a little bit for three days and it seems like they come out of it. If you do have a problem, yeah, you better jump on it. You don't want to let it go too long. Right quick, any lameness? Uh, not too much. We have padded floors. In ours, we have the easy easy fix and comfort, comfort slats. What I would say is shipping them between 1350 and 1450 is ideal. When you get them much bigger than that, then they do have a tough time getting up. And we have had some issues with that. No, I haven't had any issues. We've had a little bit when the cattle get real big and they can't get picked up by the packer. I think we get a little bit of acidotic buildup into them. We've had a little bit of, of lameness issues, but it's probably, we feed all heifers, and if we try to get heifers above, say, 14 and a quarter, they, they start to get a little tender-footed. Okay. Coming back this way, same idea, stay down there. Um, do you do any biosecurity measures with your new cattle? Uh, if so, how do you accomplish that? You know, not really. We have a lot of tours that come through. Um, we have producers that are in the cow-calf uh, programs that we do definitely. They have a, a definite biosecurity uh, protocol when you go to their uh, farms. But uh, from a finishing aspect, you know, probably the, the uh, hairy heel, you know, we definitely we try to make sure people don't have the same boots on that they're out in their yards with. And, you know, typically people are pretty smart when they come on tour that they've got a different pair of they're wearing their, I won't say their Sunday clothes, but they're not in their, their chore clothes either, so. Um, I have a consulting veterinarian that visits my place every month, and when new cattle come in, uh, he's there with me, and we, we kind of check them, and if there's an issue, we send him back, um, the critter back on the truck back. But um, basically, I'm far enough from the road, and I, or, I don't have a lot of local traffic right next to my facility. I, I would say we don't do anything in particular. What I would say is when the young cattle come in on, on the slats, they are a little uh, excited, and it is tough to pull, pull one out. It can be slick, and you got to be very careful how you pull the animals out for animal welfare reasons. We're kind of the same way, I guess. I can say if anybody comes out tomorrow to see the barn, you'll find out we're quite a ways off the beaten path that nobody's really around, we're a closed family operation, so there's really not much coming in and out of our place. All right, very good, thank you guys. Again, we're starting to get into some of the questions. If you guys have any questions, get them wrote down, hold it up, and we'll get uh, some of the uh, folks from uh, uh, from uh, hosts here, we'll uh, grab those and bring them on up. So uh, go ahead and get those wrote down. Uh, let's see, does anybody, this is an open question for anybody, does anybody have experience with Equip funding to uh, help finance the facility? Takers? Oh, Vic. I guess we did go through it. Mm -hmm. It's just a process. I don't know what you're asking questions towards. Uh, I, I think it would be kind of an ease, you know, what was your experience like? I don't know what to say. <laughs> oh. it's, a, it's, it's, it, it's the government it's, and it's a process, it's right? It's a process. We, uh, we used a guy that's sitting here from Nutrient Advisors and he helped walk us through it tremendously. He was a big help for it. Okay. And um, otherwise, he pretty well took care of it for us. Okay. Victor, you had, you've been in this? Yes, I had equip help with my first building. How did it go, Vic? Well, <clears throat> the, the government process, it takes a while. And so it, um, you know, bingo, I want to build tomorrow. Well, no, that's not going to happen because you've got to have the plans all put in, in order and everything. Uh, and all, all the T's crossed and I's dotted. And so it, it probably delayed us four months, maybe, maybe five, before everything was a go. Did you have any? Yeah, we did not use Equip on our shed, but you know we have a lot of producers that do. I, I think the biggest thing is timing, being prepared for that delay, for some of it to go slower, you know. 
you hear some talk out in the, in the industry or people say, well, the equip, it cost me more for the engineering than what we got paid for. It was a, it was a push. You know, I don't, depends on what the bar you're building and what the design is, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, you can look at it from a, a water quality aspect that that money's your money coming back to you. So, you know, I think it's something that people should look into and then make a decision on if that's what direction they want to go or not. Since you have the mic, I'm going to ask you this question too. Uh, since you're kind of the, the building salesman, maybe you could talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, what maybe what sets your buildings apart. And I'm thinking, I'm basing this on what happened starting in eastern Nebraska, but across Iowa and Illinois, and uh, that happened last summer. That wonderful derecho, those uh, uh, very fast winds. Um, <laughs> what sort of a challenge does that present when it comes to? you know, designing and putting up and deciding what we're going to do for buildings? Well, I don't know quite how to answer that. I'm, I'm not going to sit up here and say we had no problems, but I'll, I'll tell you the buildings that had problems were buildings that were mostly used for, for uh, loafing sheds or cattle arms that were on eight foot wood posts. And as Vic can attest to, original wood in our cattle building design. So we have um, buildings on I beam steel posts. It's hot dip galvanized here in Nebraska. So. I think we probably had a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of, of uh, steel damage, really more than we had cover damage. So we went through the Derosio really as about as good as could be expected, and it went really right through our, our heart of our sales here in eastern Nebraska, central Iowa. So um, our buildings are engineered just like any other metal building would be um, for the wind speeds and the snow loads, and so. Um, I don't want to sit up here on a panel and say good, better, best, but the idea is, is that a properly, whatever building, we're not here to necessarily tell you to build an Accu steel barn or build a steel barn or build this kind of barn. I'm more interested in getting people together that are interested in the buildings. I think there are some designs of buildings. Uh, all of our buildings are gable shaped, they're not model slope. We think gable are real important for airflow, to get air underneath the eaves and get out the center. Um, the engineering is important, buying from a reputable company. If you have problems, we don't, not everything that we do is 100%, but we try to work with our dealers, CCS. Uh, we work with them to try to take care of if there's any issues in the buildings. Um, quite honestly, for we probably do, and this isn't, for maybe some of you have our buildings out there, but we probably do more repairs from people running into the building than we do from any kind of wind damage, but that's, that's, probably, that's probably the truth. But, um, we do some things at Acu Steel that are different than what you think about for act for, for, for tarp buildings. But the reality is, is is really buy from who you trust and work go and go look at as many buildings as you can. There is lots of builders out there. I say when we have dealers bring in and customers, Brad brought in some guys a couple weeks ago. Um, I think every building they went to go look at, they learned something new at. So you can't, I know it's a big investment, I know time's really valuable, but you guys are all here today, take a couple days out of, your, out of your work, go look at somebody else's building, ask questions, what would they change? You know, my favorite tour is I, and we do this a lot in the building industry, you get a brand new building built, and it's all nice and shiny, and there's hardly a turd on the ground yet, everybody wants to have an open house. My favorite open house is when we do like the cattlemen's groups from Nebraska, Iowa, or Missouri, we go to a building that's 10 years old, that guy has something to tell you. He can tell you the performance of the barn. He can tell you um, how the cattle do, how the cattle flow, how the working facility work. Those are the questions that you get out of a guy that's at 10 years. And I had a gentleman in Iowa, this hasn't been 10 years, probably been, well, it might have been 10 years ago now. He's had his barn for quite a while. But make a long story short, he was talking a big story. He was going through his building and whatnot. And somebody asked him, well, how much did it cost? And the guy responds, uh, Jeff Longnecker was his name, maybe some of you guys know him in here. But Jeff kind of sat back and he goes, you know, it was a lot of money. I can't remember what I paid for, but it was too damn much. I'm sure it was. And he was looking at me and said that. Well, then he, he turned around and he said, but you guys all remember when it snowed last fall? They had a snow that closed. He's right outside of Ames, Iowa. They closed Interstate 35 north of Ames. I think it might have closed even down to Des Moines. They, they closed 35. He goes, that morning, I moved about five bucket loads of snow with the skid loader, and I fed cattle on time. He goes, I didn't have any snow in the barn, my cattle were dry, and they ate just like they did every other day. I'm not saying every day is exactly the same in the barn, but there's no bad days. There was a lot of cattle that didn't get fed in, in that part of Iowa that didn't get fed for some of them two days. 
Well, and I've, I've got a feedlot and I've had stuff go south in a hurry. You know, we one time broke the PTO shaft off the gearbox, not just the PTO shaft, but the whole gearbox and blah, blah, blah. Make a long story short, when you don't feed cattle on time or you don't have that repeatability, that's, that's, that's a huge, we spent probably three weeks trying to get back to where we were. And I don't know if we ever got back to where we were anyway. So it's a tool in a toolbox. I don't want to drive the panel here, but it's just the idea is it's, it's a tool. Sure. All right, now next question, and again, we'll kind of open it up to whoever would like to respond. After you built your facility, after you built your building, what is one thing you would add, or is there something that you would change? And again, this is reference to your facility. Any thoughts? I would just give you the salesman to say bigger, 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 bigger. <laughs> the jury will disregard. <laughs> um, I guess... I was just satisfied with what I had. I was so tickled to get out of the mud, um, and um, I still like it. <laughs> I mean, there's days that you wonder when a blizzard's coming, <laughs> where's it coming from? And but uh, um, I'm I'm still very satisfied with what I've got, and I'm and I'm glad for the investment. Jesse, any thoughts? Anything you would change or do different? Well, uh, one thing we've added to our cow barn was gutters. Uh, you don't don't you can't imagine how much water comes off of there and puddles up on you, especially if you don't have concrete underneath. Um, the other thing that I would say with looking at the buildings, airflow is one of the most important things you've got to, to, to look at. We have another uh, monoslope building with uh, concrete pins, and it's actually the most important in the winter. It, it's not drying out because we don't have the proper airflow, and we're going to improve that with some curtains or opening the building up more, but be, be conscious of airflow when you're choosing your design. Just a question on airflow, Has that have there been any uh, animal health effects because of that, or is it more uh, just the way the facility operates? It's, it's more how, the, how it operates. There, mm -hmm. There's a little bit, they're, they're a little more uncomfortable when they don't have the airflow, but it's drying things out so it's not slick. Gotcha, perfect. I know you guys have a fairly new facility, but have you had any, uh, <laughs> any, any grand ideas or any thoughts on doing sure. something different? The one thing that we're both really interested in doing, and Zach, every time I talk to him, don't talk to him that much anymore since it's built, but he keeps laughing. He says, when are you guys going to get this up and going? We had um, put channels in the wall on top, and we're working with the guy that does a lot of steel work with us. Our one number one thing is, is we want to put a catwalk up over the top of the pins. The pins, like he said, when they first come in, and a shed is amazing. The cattle come in and in the outside yard where, where yard where we receive, if you get in some cattle out of the south, you swear they're going to take all the panels down. You put them cattle, and they can be that way for five, six weeks. We had to set outside for four and a half weeks. We stuck them in the shed, and this is no kidding. In 10 days, you can walk through the pen, and within a month and a half, you can touch the cattle. But when you're walking through them cattle and they're new in that barn and everything is so confined, we really think a big advantage would be a catwalk over the top where you can see them cattle before you disturb the cattle. Like you say, when the cattle go in, you crawl in a 48 by 60 foot pen and they're pounding our cement walls because they're just trying to get absolutely away from you. That's You can't see any because if you crawl on one side, they'll pile the other. And I think we had two that spread his back legs in there that first time with the Arkansas calves and it was, yeah, not good. If you're wondering what we're thinking with the catwalk, the catwalk design theory that we want is, and we make us out to be kids, but we've heard of guys doing it, you walk over the top of the catwalk, you see something drooping, you carry a paintball gun with you. You shoot the calf, he's easy to pull out later. Mm -hmm. Great idea. I, I would agree with the catwalk. When they get about 1,400 pounds and they want to snuggle with you, it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, had a question come in here. How many feet of bump do you allow for new incoming high-stressed cattle? I guess we try not to buy those, but if, if we do, um, we start cattle on about 16 inches of bump at our, our home barn, uh, where we start cattle at where I live. Um, we've got a deal where We've got, I, I'm not a big fan of split bunks once I had them. Uh, we built a lot of barns that way and that's how my first barn was built. We had a uh, north alleyway we drove through. We also work cattle in that alleyway. Travis has been up and seen that at our place. Uh, so we try to utilize as much space as we can. 
Uh, we have portable equipment, so it's the, the guys that work with, they don't necessarily like it. They have to set it up, tear it down all the time. We try to utilize that space as much as much as possible. Um, but then on the south side of the building, instead of just having a standard J-bunk, we actually put in, I think, Divine Concrete's here today. We put in a H-bunk system where we actually, we've got a picture up at our booth, if anybody wants to answer, explain later. But when my guys come to feed them in the morning, we actually have to walk cattle down around the bunk, and then we have slam gates that, that lock them onto the pack side. So that gives us a lot more bunk space, and we actually utilize that in our finishing barn, the second barn we built. We have that H-bunk system. We really like that for... For, for more bunk spaces. The buildings get wider. It's, it's not as big a deal with the slatted barns because of your square footage, but as barns get wider in the pack barn situation to maintain your, your, your bunk space, we try to maintain at least 12 inches. Well, those cattle have access to both sides of the bunk. And uh, I just threw a shout out to the Divine guys, but I'll also throw up now, we, we poured those bunks ourselves. So we've got a poured H bunk with a, with a feed rail over so we don't get cattle in the bunk. And that's, that has really worked out really well for us. So. Mine is at uh, 16 inches. Uh, <clears throat> my bunk is 80 foot long and I put 60 head there. We kind of are a different situation. Like he said, we're just starting with the new shed, but everything that we start starts outside. So we start with the 190 foot pan with the 120 to 130 head. Then we move them down into, once we get them started, we move them down into 170 foot pans. Then they go up into a shed and they've got 150 foot once they get up into the shed. So space-wise, we start out quite a bit of space and work our way down. Okay. Okay, help me remember, guys. Which one of you, who has a, a pit that you have to manage? Both of you guys? Okay, I have a, a card with a few questions about pit management. So we'll kind of go back and forth between you guys here just for a short time. Um, do you have a full year's capacity in your pit? No, you get a pump twice, twice a year. Okay, you? We're just starting, so we put the first cattle in there in September. Right now it's looking like we're going to be real close, but we went 12 foot 7 inches, so we had a full 12 foot underneath the pit slots. Okay, so um, pit is under the structure, not outside? Is that yeah. for both of you guys? Pit is underneath? Okay. Um, pump out on outside of building? Ours, we kind of did a different design. We worked with, we kind of started with the guy that was there and he left, but we took him a couple places and looked at some different swing gates. We've got bunks on both sides, but we've got 15 foot, they made us steel majors that we actually don't have to move feed bunks. We swing these gates in and out, and we've got what they call a double slap. It's got, I think it's a three foot square manhole maybe it's 50 inch and basically we'll just move the cattle into the back alley we'll lift these manholes out swing the gates open pump out and then close it up okay. pump out for you so our, our bunks are on the east side and our pump outs on the west side we do have gates that will swing um, to create an area to, to pump out um, the guy that does our pumping is paranoid so we we pull the cattle out of the pen um, pull one set. There's four pins. We pull one set out, put it in an outside pin for two weeks while it pumps, and then we just rotate the cattle. So he has no fear of them falling in. Okay. Uh, one other question on the pits. Um, how do you handle preventing water lines freezing? I guess this is maybe for everybody, but... Uh... They're, they're underneath in the pit, and we've never had an issue with it being 50 below. Not, I mean, and they're, they're continuous waters uh, is what we, what we run. Okay. Water lines? We thought we were smart. We wanted to keep the manure as potent as it could be. We had the experience this year. We had heaters underneath each one of the tanks, and he was exactly sick. I think he planned that. <laughs> I went out and checked chores that night, and we had a water line froze. And it froze right in the elbow where it went down the wall. We've got 16 inch walls with 8 inch tubes coming up. and. We got underneath there and we blew heat, we poured hot water, we got it thawed. The next morning we turned up the heaters that night, the next morning I came, well we both went to feed cattle, and while I'm feeding outside pens, he walks the yards and we park the equipment and he looks at me and said, Dad, we got a problem. I said, now what? He said, between pen seven and eight, the water is froze. I that out great. We went through this last night. By the time we got that thawed, that coldest day of the year, we spent 
from 8.30 in the morning when we got done doing chores until 1 o'clock. We neither one were in a very good mood. Every one of the, every one of the water lines froze underneath. So if you have an experience putting up a shed, we found out that day you turned the trickle on and we didn't want to run the overflows, but we learned when it gets below zero, you turn the trickles on. Was that the third week in February when that happened? Whatever. Yeah. And I could be wrong, uh, I'd have to double check with him, but uh, the one day we kind of screwed up, we put PVC pipes from our water hole all the way to the waters, and uh, it actually got snowed down into our hole because it wraps around the trees and somehow lifted the lid and got snowed down in there, and that's how it froze up, I think, the first time. First time. Hmm. Uh, we'll send the mic down to the other end. Any thoughts about keeping water lines <coughs> flowing? Uh, we have the canned creek water in our system and it's electrical uh, on a thermostat and it's all under, underground when it comes to it. Um, yeah, we've got uh, concrete waters too. Um, probably things we did is we ran two water lines in case we had a problem with one at the time. Once they have the trench open, it wasn't that much more money to run that second line. The other thing that we do, and I'm sure a lot of these guys have too, but we have a little office area where we've got a water distributor where we can hook up in, in line. We can uh, medicate the waters for certain pins. We can have, we have each pin has its own water system. So we want to run CTC or we want to run aspirin or electrolyte um, in, the, in the waters. It's not probably as important for the bigger cattle, but I know a lot of the cow calf operators have that. And uh, it's been a really good tool for us, especially bringing in um, like we start bringing lighter weight calves all the time and you know those calves may not be bulk broke or but they'll usually all find the water and they can get in there and they can get uh, a little bit of a jump start on them. All right very good we're getting close to the end of our producer panel here but we still got a few minutes for you guys to uh, write down your question and get them sent up. I've got a couple up here yet but uh, yeah if you, if you have any lingering questions and you want to ask the guys who are using this each and every day, now's the time to uh, get that jot, jotted down and uh, send it on up here. Um, so I'll ask this question and we'll just work our way from one end to the other. The, what was written on the card here is it says backgrounding or finishing. Uh, what was the better fit and why? We just always were finishing cattle, so that's just what we stayed with. I guess like you said, I'm Stubborn. My dad told me a long time ago I wanted a background. He said if you got the work done a background, you just won't finish it. <laughs> in, in the deep pit, the first year we put our home raised calves, started about five, six hundred pounds. The diet you give them is a little too too thick for the pit to pump it out. And we had to agitate and add a lot of water. So we went to strictly finishing. Um, nothing, nothing below 750 pounds goes in there to start. As I said before, I'm, I'm backgrounding calves, I'm buying 550 to 600 pound calves, and, uh, and I'm pushing them to the game from that 2 to 2.2 pounds a day, so that in 100 to 110 days I have an 840 pound steer to take back to somebody else's lot. And it, it just works better for my system and my state of mind, because uh, you guys fattening cattle I, I I really think of you about trying to market these cattle, especially through the pandemic when you went through and nobody was bidding for you. Um, and I, I didn't have that to worry about. And so uh, the other reason is uh, um, I have, I've had an easier time hedging feeder cattle than I had hedging fat cattle when I was uh, doing fat cattle. And so uh, this system works for, for our family and and for what we want to do. So I think that's, that speaks to the versatility of the bedded barns. Um, I think all operations from outside lots, if you can control your water to run off all the way to a, a pitted barn, all have their place in operation. But uh, I tied into a group of cattle two groups ago that uh, were all open heifers, and I think we capped out about 60 of them. So I got in the cow-calf business accidentally for a while. So. <laughs> I learned a lot, way like more than I wanted to. So I, I don't think I ever bought a set of chains, but I think I got the long glove on my shoulder now. So, um, but no, I think the versatility of the barns, you can just do a lot of different things with them. Um, you know, um, sometimes I feel like Vic does, marketing and fat cattle isn't much fun, but it allows, the buildings that we have, allows us to grow cattle, so we can get cattle in a wider weight where they make a little bit more sense. We can kind of be our own backgrounder, like what you guys said down there. If you're going to go through the work and the death loss of the background and, and get them up 
why not just finish them? Um, I I uh, definitely appreciate Vic's stance, though, and not trying to market fat cattle. That's something I'm still trying to learn to do. So I've given a lot of practice money to Chicago, I can tell you that. So. <laughs> You kind of brought up a good point, and I don't know if there's a if we want to spend too much time on it. Vic uh, talked a little bit about how this works into his marketing plan. Is any other insight into uh, anybody? Would you volunteer anything? How does that? Uh, were you able to do something different or uniquely, or uh, how does that all fit in, if anything? I'll drop the mic here because I have nothing to say about marketing. It's, it's still a learning deal. <laughs> Um, but basically, you know, you bring in these calves and you know what your feed costs are and things like this. And what you can take and, and what I take and do, excuse me, is, is I, I figure out what I've got to have, what I'm going to have in those calves, what, what I'm going to go with them, and what they're going to be weighing, and what I want for a profit. And when the board is at that point, I, I get my position. I don't want to put words around it, but under roof is predictable. That is one thing that we try to run a schedule where we have the cattle in our place for 240 days. We try to buy them in a circle weight range and we try to get them gone. Now, like I say, the packer doesn't always play with that. Sometimes we can't get the cattle bought right at the right time or at the right price, but we try to run a flow system. So we try to market about 2,400 head a year through two barns. So they're at one barn for 120 days, they're at another barn for another 120 days, and then they're to be gone. So, and that's not perfect. You always got a little dead time in there, but the idea is that we can turn our money on that system and we can get a cash flow established and we get three cracks at the market. When I just had that single barn, a lot of what drove me to build the second one was is we had that just one barn. We really only had one good look at the market and if we tried to you tried to want to sell cattle in April or May, well then now you're back selling back in a bad month. So it allowed us to have a little bit better marketing durability by having multiple pins ready at different times. And then the other thing is when I'm when I do have an 830 or 40 pound steer, I like to take it back to the market, and because I'm proud of the cattle when I'm, when I'm that far, and uh, I let the people bid on them. And I, I think that's uh, auction market has always been a really good old way of selling things, and uh, I like it, and then, and uh, I just dread the day when it'll be gone. But I, I think I'm making use of it at this time. Yeah, I would say the consistency, it, when you do a projection, you, you, after four or five years, you know what you're going to produce out of that, that barn. And, and if you don't know how to manage it when you're outside, you got Mother Nature as the variable, and it's a little tougher. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, I got two questions, and then we'll wrap up our panel here tonight. So, uh, from this end going that way, uh, you know, okay, now that the project is all done, but you look at all of these other factors that are in ag. You know, if, if it's land price, if it's a cost of uh, mama cows, replacement heifers, um, <laughs> the cost of the building, um, the volatile market we were just talking about here, was it worth it? And I guess. Why do you say that? I'd say yes, because I grew up with cattle and I always love feeding cattle. I love being around cattle. It gives you a reason to wake up in the morning. Was well, it worth it? I'll tell you in 15 years. Hmm. Um, All right, everybody, make, uh, write it on your calendar. We're going to come back and talk to Paul. And... My opinion, and I didn't answer the question before, because I'll admit marketing to me is one of the worst things to do. Yeah. Um, he wanted to come home. Like he said, it's consistency. We can market our products through it. We can utilize what comes back out of it. That's kind of our outlook, and if it's worth it, we'll vote in 15 years. Was it worth it? Well, after uh, 2019 and, and spending a large amount of money cleaning out our outside bins, it, it brought a different perspective to not having to spend that maintenance on, on, on the deep pit barn. Um, Six months into it, I will admit what he just said. It's awful nice when it's snowing and blowing and you go in there and take your coat off and walk through it. There you go. But I think we need to continue to learn and how to do it better in, in the economics of it. it, it I, do, I do think it takes 10 years before you really learn what you have. Victor, you're close. Is it worth it? <laughs> it, it was worth it for me. I mean, there's just all the things, you know, with the family farm and, and keeping everybody involved and the other thing that I, I noticed is my muck boots last a lot longer than they used to. I think somewhere there's a new buzzword about regenerative farming, and I think it's that 
cycle bringing livestock back to, to in, in my part of the country there's lots of livestock but it's it's really concentrated and being able to do it on a medium or medium sized scale um, uh, Nebraska probably small scale but the idea is is bringing back that that cycle of raising crops provide the manure back it, it's a good cycle and, and where I'm at um, you know the idea of going out and having a quarter if it even comes up for sale or you're being able to afford it you know this was a way for me to grow my agricultural operation and and obviously it was a it was a great a synergy with our with AccuSteel, but the idea was it was something that really made sense for our operation. And I think overall it's going to pay off benefits in the long term. Very good, guys. Thank you so much for being up here. Now, okay, hold up, Mike, down there. This is the last question. We're going to come this way, and I'm going to give uh, the panel a caveat here. the The question is, you know, because there's there's a lot of people in the crowd here that are thinking about doing something like this, right? They're they're exploring their options. Should we do it this way? Should we do it that way? Whatever the case may be. Uh, so for you, the panel, give the group, give the crowd one takeaway message about building when it comes to cattle confinement and, and finishing one thing that they should remember. Either it's something that you learned or a piece of advice or you know whatever the case may be. We'll work our way from the far end this way and you can't duplicate answers. We're gonna have five, <laughs> we're gonna have five individual answers for you guys to remember here tonight. So uh, we'll start with Jason on the end. All right, um, probably the two things I wanna tell people it is a tool. If you've never fed cattle and you think it's a way to get cheap manure, it is, that is not what this is. Have a plan to make money with the cattle and treat the building as a tool. It is another tool in your toolbox to be more successful. It's not, there's no easy answers, it's still management, it's still work, it's a tool. Have a plan to make money with the cap. All right, it's a tool. Okay, um, if you have interest, don't be in a hurry to build, go tear, tour lots of facilities and ask the producers how they would do different. Because um, that's what we're, when I put mine together, it was a lot of things that I learned from other people. And uh, I think that's, that's the big thing, is that, that you need to get as much information as you can, and then it doesn't hurt to have a consultant sit down with you with numbers. So when you're, when you're putting your budget together and you think, boy, this is a lot of money, and then you decide to save 10% on something like, uh, I'm not going to put concrete along my driveway, I'm going to rock it, you will pay more in rock in the first two years <laughs> than you will with the concrete cost really listen to the people that have done it before. They got a lot of good advice for you. All right, so so far we've heard it's it's a tool. It's part of your overall program, right? Next thing we heard, tour facilities. See what's out there. Concrete it out is what I heard from you. <laughs> Hard surface is a good thing. All right, Paul. I could take it, two things and one will be a kind of comical side of it. The first one is it's kind of like, for us, it's a two-way deal. We can feed our own cattle, that's what we love to do. But you've always got the option, you can custom feed. It is amazing, we went to put it up and I had a discussion with one person, I says, what if this thing don't work? We've got a million dollar investment sitting here. And instantly, I had a feature tell me, not a problem, I can fill that. I can't fill outside yards if you want to keep going. Second thing, the joke part of it is, I'd still keep the tank heaters in, but make sure and turn on your overflows. <laughs> gotcha. Last words from Justin. Uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, probably, I was arguing, Dad, we need to go bigger. We both thought it was going to be perfectly good where it was. And just don't build too big to start without knowing overly what you know, because we went triple our dirt work because we didn't know exactly what it was going to be and we kind of won it and it didn't turn out as good as we thought it was going to be on that side of it. All right, very good. Great insight from the crowd. Hey, would, would you guys please give this uh, producer panel a great